Good evening, Modesto Junior College. Welcome to the Spring 2024 Speech Night. My name is Professor Ryan Guy, and for the last 10, well, almost 11 years now, it has been my distinct honor to be the Director of Forensics here at Modesto Junior College. We're super excited to see you all tonight. We have a great show in store for you. I just got a couple of housekeeping things to take care of before we get going. First and foremost, I'm guessing many of you might be here tonight as part of a requirement for your communication studies class. If that's the case, how many hands? How many people are Yeah, it's kind of what I thought. So, if that's the case, my guess is that your professor gave you directions on what they wanted you to do for speech night. Now, if you're like, I don't think that they did, or you forgot to look at the camera's assignment, don't worry, we got you covered. As you came in, you should have gotten one of those critique sheets. Most instructors have students fill out the critique sheet. If they don't need to do something else, do that. But if they didn't, you can fill this out. It's got two sides on it. One side is going to be for the first half of the show, where we're going to have a whole bunch of exciting speakers, ranging from informative speaking, persuasive speaking, impromptu speaking, dramatic interpretation of literature, all that stuff you can summarize on the front. On the back, it's going to be for the debate, which is going to be the second half of the evening, where we have a couple of MJC students come up here and uh, square off against each other in a heated rhetorical, oratorical battle that you all get to watch. Fill out the back for that. Almost every instructor I know wants you to do both sides, so make sure you do both sides. With that, I'm super excited to see you all tonight. I want to do just a couple of quick thank yous and just tell you a little bit about what we've got in store for you all. So first off, on the thank yous. I've got to really shout out to the Modesto Junior College Speech and Debate Team. These fantastic folks sitting in the front row are some of the most hardworking individuals that I've had the pleasure to work with here at MJC. They spend their weeks and nights preparing and training, practicing, memorizing, studying, cutting cards, getting evidence together so that they can spend their weekends traveling to tournaments all over the state of California and as we get into the latter half of the year, all over the country. They are an incredibly hardworking group of folks who just brought back a first place Sweet Stakes Award from the Northern California Forensics Association Championship. Can we give it up for these folks? Thank you for coming with us, guys. In addition, I gotta thank the Modesto Junior College Communication Studies Department. You know your professors, they're awesome folks. Give it up for them. I feel myself incredibly lucky to get to work with such an amazing group of people, and they're constantly supporting our program, sending folks to join the speech and debate team, and it's been an absolute pleasure. Last, but definitely not, not least, I gotta give a shout out to the Modesto Junior College School of Arts, Performance, and Humanities, which many of you are members, uh, members of. Our front office staff really work incredibly hard, especially folks like Sandra and Jacqueline answering the phone calls, make sure you got tickets, sell tickets to the front, um, but all the student workers too to help make tonight possible. Give it up for those people. <laughs> and last but not least, we got to give it up for uh, Dean Rob Stevenson, the leader of our ship, and uh, always, uh, always backing us up and supporting me, and always willing to take my phone calls when that's some tournament in the middle of nowhere, calling at 11 o'clock at night with an issue. Really, yeah. Uh, Appreciate that. Woo! All right, guys. So, a little bit of history. The Modesto Junior College Speech and Debate Team has existed for almost as long as MJC has itself. During the second semester that MJC was open, so the spring of 1922, a group of MJC students came together and said, hey, we want to have a speech and debate group here on campus, and we want to be able to go and compete with other schools and colleges. And so that group of students came, uh, came together, formed the first group, did a few couple tournaments in that first semester, and then especially starting in the fall of 2022, they gathered an either bigger cross-section, both men and women, and started competing and going to different tournaments all across the uh, across the state. And so for the last hundred years, MJC students have spent their weekends traveling to tournaments, bringing home awards, and basically showing off their uh, their skills. And we are one of the most award-winning teams in the country. Tonight, you're going to get an opportunity to see the next generation of that group of students. And they're going to entertain you with dramatic interpretation. They're going to inform you through an informative speech. Hopefully, they're going to persuade you with a persuasive speech. And they're going to give you an opportunity to watch what I think is going to be a pretty lively, uh, lively debate. 
As we work through the first half of the evening, really let it, these folks know that you're enjoying the show. You can applaud, you can say here, here, but particularly when we get to the second half of the night, when the debaters come up and they're on stage, debate is a really interactive activity. And so it's made more fun for everyone, including the debaters, if you let them hear you while you're, uh, while you're listening to their arguments. So if someone says something that you particularly agree with, feel free to applaud with what they're, uh, what they're saying. You can knock on the little uh, handrails, you can stomp your, uh, stomp your feet. It's meant to be an audience engaged activity. So with that, I really hope you enjoy the, uh, enjoy the show. I'm gonna turn it over to my partner in crime. Give it up for co-director of forensics, Professor Troy Schott. Like sunlight, enzymes in organisms, 
and bacteria. But this is also how we earned their name forever, cubicles. In 2002 new study, the USGS found that 45% of our tap water has one or more forever chemicals in it. Creating the same key flaws by the accumulate in human bodies. According to the 2022 study by the CDC, that discovered PFAS in the blood of 97% of U.S. residents. The CDC goes on to explain that humans' widespread and continuous exposure to PFAS can lead to reduced fertility, increased risk of cancer, and reduced ability for the immune system to fight infections and diseases. This is where your food water comes in. According to the website, Lab Access, in January 2024, Invictor Water's mission is to eliminate PFAS and other risky chemicals from water in an economical, safe, and environmentally friendly manner. Invictor Water partnered with BNL, an advanced manufacturing company, to develop a filtration media that captures, removes, and destroys PFAS. In the previously cited WRL report, Invictor is able to do this because they discovered a cutting edge approach that allows them to use more nitride and light to create a chemical reaction that destroys PFAS particles without toxic byproducts. This approach allows them to collect the PFAS in the water, break their carbon bonds, and destroy the PFAS completely. Next, let's take a dive to find out how this technology works to achieve this. It is water and thin animals technology doesn't just remove our chemicals from the water. It is actually using nanotechnology to destroy the chemicals in the water. The unique combination with their technology and a three-step filtration process makes this possible. Previously, I mentioned that the Nano is a manufacturing company. Primarily, they produce nanotechnology using the chemical formula for nitride, or BN. Brian Clegg wrote for Chemistry Real that BN is the best kept secret of all chemistry due to its versatility and application. Victor Water is harnessing its power in creative ways. Rice professor Michael Wong explained in a 2020 article for Rice News, you take a glass of water that contains some level of field wick. You throw it in the powder and seal it up. Expose that glass to ultraviolet light, come back in four hours, and 99% of the field wave has been transformed. According to a journal 2021 article from the American Waterworks Association, this works because BN is what's known as a photo catalyst. This means the BN absorbs UV light, and the reaction between the two degrades the PFAS. Let's look at this a little more closely. On our website, Evictor Water describes the three stages stripping, enrichment, and destruction. Stage one, stripping. In this stage, incoming water from whatever source is separated into two streams. Any PFAS free water, usually about 90% of the total water volume, is sent to the clean stream. The other 10% of the PFAS contaminated water is sent to the waste stream. The PFAS are stripped from the water and sent to stage two. The next stage is enrichment. In this stage, the incoming waste stream from stage one is again separated into two streams. The enriched waste stream and the water return stream. The waste stream from stage one is concentrated to form the enriched waste stream, which reduces the contaminated water by another 90%. The enriched waste stream is transferred to stage three. The remaining water, now PFAS free, is returned to stage one, the clean stream. The final stage, destruction, was given its name for obvious reasons. In this stage, the PFAS molecules are destroyed, and the contaminated water is returned to stage two for another filtration. Victor Water and B and Nano's ability to filter contaminated water is an exciting development. So let's bring out possible implications. The first and most obvious implication, of course, is clean water. But what does that really mean? In an obvious 2023 video, Steve Wilsinski, Chief Executive of Victor Water, explained that they plan to start small with municipal water systems. Eventually, they'll work to decontaminate the water supplies from micro breweries, energy drink companies, hydroponics, and even home systems. Basically, with this technology, they hope to make any water source used for consumption free of forever chemicals. Second, there are implications for environmental justice. Peer reviewed research published in 2023 in the journal Environmental Science and Technology explains 
that Hispanic and Black communities are disproportionately served by water systems that contain higher levels of PFAS. The 2003 study by The Verge explains this is because pollution choices like industrial plants, military bases, and landfills are often built near these neighborhoods. In 2022, the National Library of Medicine showed that social factors like race, ethnicity, and poverty can place people at disproportionately high risk for diseases due to hazardous exposures like this. Granted, environmental racism is a systemic problem that requires action beyond the scope of a drinking water. But air technology is a promising development that can lessen the impact on communities that have lived with contaminated water resources. Finally, this technology can bridge the gap of their policy efforts. The United States is currently exploring relations, including a proposed requirement for companies to disclose the PFAS that can be used in their product, according to KF Health News. However, that article points out that these regulations would not address existing environmental contamination due to the production and disposal of these products. If the water's technology is critical in addressing existing forever chemicals. Today, we explore the Victor Waters and decided ability to destroy PFAS forever. We first examine what their technology is, how it works, and key implications. Jacob Fritz and Stephen Zinsky hope that their method of destroying forever chemicals will prevent others from going through the heartbreak they face with Michelle's death. Lazinski stated in the previously cited WRL report, for us, it's more than a business, it's personal. Thankfully, we are one step closer to a world with clean water for everyone. Because the reality is, it's personal for all of us. seconds used. One minute used. One minute and thirty years. John Connor, we have to get, we have to leave, we have to go now. Now, although Terminator is a, 
exactly the most influential movie on my life. I still absolutely love Arnold. He's a great actor, not to mention the character he portrays. He portrays the Terminator, the be-all end-all of murderous human machines. And thus, so is John Connor left in a very difficult situation. John Connor is being hunted by literally the entire future by an AI that is so hell-bent on his destruction that it will send robots back in time just to have him killed. Now, John Connor serves as a great example of what it means to truly be, well, left with no other option. He is very much in a struggle that I personally would want to be. Now, instead of lying down and letting it happen like I probably would, he instead chooses to believe in not only himself, but also in what he was given, with all the cards that he had in his hand. Now, I was reminded of this movie when I received a quotation today of, I don't like to gamble, but if there's one thing I'm willing to, it's on myself, by Beyonce. And I interpret this as, believing in yourself is your ultimate power. And we're going to look at this through three main areas, and why I really agree. The first of which is going to be Eraser, Young and Modern World. The second of which is going to be a movie, Talladega Nights. And lastly, we're going to end with the strongest woman I've ever seen. Now, shifting into gear and getting right onto that track, we start with Jan Martinborough, who actually didn't start on the track. He started with a game. He started with a game simple as Gran Turismo. He's a PlayStation player, as hopefully many people maybe play PlayStation. Now, Jan Martinborough wasn't exactly the greatest of athletes. He played tennis soccer, but he was mostly enthralled with his game. He was very much interested in racing, but he was never really given the opportunity to actually show what he could do which was a problem. Because every single person that thought of what he could do, they all, did, they all said he was crazy, essentially. He was the biggest, brightest racer in terms of PC gaming, or any kind of game. The problem is, is that the world wasn't very accepting of gamers as racers, understandable. It's a very difficult competition. But when he was given the opportunity, he showed, he really showed what he could do. He was able to prove not only that he was the best in Europe, he proved that he was the best in every single country. He competed online against many other competitors until eventually he was given the chance to compete in an actual race car. And when he did, he won every single race against any person out there. It was a struggle, and no one really believed it. The entire racing community thought it was a joke, that he was a joke. Now, he didn't take that in stride, he instead used it to focus himself, that he was going to be his strongest player, his strongest believer. And it worked. He was able to prove just what a gamer could do on the racetrack. Now, although many of us aren't NASCAR racers or maybe even NASCAR fans, driving in circles is one of the favorite all-time pastimes of our man, Ricky Bobby. In the movie Talladega Nights, he is the forefront of winning. If he coined the term, if you ain't first, you're definitely last. Now, Ricky Bobby is one that truly believes in himself above all else, until he did it. He lost. He lost to a Frenchman who came across the water and showed just how awful Ricky Bobby could truly be. He thought he was on fire, when in fact he wasn't. Didn't it? But Ricky never let that stop. He was broken. He was a shell of a man. But he realized that there were things in his life that were the reason he kept racing. Sure, he raced to be first and never last, but that wasn't a reason to race. It wasn't until he realized that having a family, having people that cared about him, were why you should believe. But not only that, the fact that he had to believe in himself, as himself as a racer, of what he could truly do. People were saying that he'd never get back on track. But when he eventually did in that final race, he was able to prove just how strong his will was and how much he believed in himself, albeit it was an illegal finish, and he ran across the finish line. But he proved just how strong and how much he truly believed in himself, when others simply didn't. Now, believing in yourself, especially when faced with incredible odds, is one that I would never, ever want to be in this situation. Ripley is a very much stronger person than I ever am. She's faced with a very difficult task. Basically, survive. She's left on a spaceship where all of her friends have been killed and an alien is running rampant, trying to hunt her down. She was left with essentially nothing. Many of the viewers even thought that she was gonna die, simply because she 
was a woman in a time where women weren't seen as a very strong, upheld character. But instead, Ripley was shown to be someone of the most strong character and will person you would have ever seen. Not only was she able to kill the alien, she was able to survive, which is something that many people wouldn't be able to attest to, not even me. I would not want to be in her situation. But because she believed in herself, because she realized that nothing was going to stop her from her one simple goal of taking revenge on the alien for killing her friends, that she was going to be strong in the face of challenge, that she truly was able to demonstrate how much power you could draw from. Now, I received a quotation today. I don't like to gamble, but if there's one thing I'm willing to bet on, it's myself by Beyonce. And I took this to be, you should believe in yourself. And that's your strongest power. And we looked at that through three main little lenses. The first of which was our man, Yon Marlboro, a racer. Second of which, Talladega Knights, our man, Ricky Bobby, proving that just because if he wasn't first, doesn't mean he was last. And of course, with Rip in Alien, where she proved just how strong a willed person could truly be. Now, Terminator and, well, John Connor in general isn't exactly someone that I would think of to be a profitable position. Now, although he wasn't able to exactly understand where he was coming from or where anything was happening to him from, he proved that he was going to be strong in the face of challenge. That just because he was a kid, and just because the entire future was hunting him down, doesn't mean that he was going to lay down and take it. Now, as nostalgic as Terminator is, all things, even nostalgic, must come to an end. Thank you. with this performance at a recent tournament. Please join us in welcoming her to the stage. Oh my god, my head. Is there any air 
water flowing here. Oh, every single freaking day, I swear. Oh shit! I smell like shit. Okay. 1840 hours, acknowledge solar activity, little prep. So far, no apparent malfunctions. Uh, having some difficulty with suit odor? Ventilation still continues to be a problem. I'm still getting CO2 headaches every time I go to sleep. Uh, acknowledge score. Of course the year I go to Mars is the one where the Texans are suddenly good. Is there a way for you to transmit recordings of the game? Highlights, maybe? Acknowledge and return. I miss coffee. Ooh, that heat sink is hot. You gotta be kidding me, that's a chick. Burnt out. Probably because there isn't sufficient ventilation in here. Guys, I've told you there's something not right with this airflow. Jesus Christ, this is basic stuff. The whole computer could have burnt up. Do I need to explain to you guys what that would mean? End of mission, end of colony, end of the commander. Done. Dead. It is my life right here. It's my. Everything is fine. Just reroute the processor pathways. No memory damage. So it's good. Redundant systems, redundant systems. Diagnostic revealed burnt chip, or peat, burnt chip. Rerouting circuit pathways to compensate. Acknowledge and return. Oh, God. Smelling like poop. Crying all the time. This place is turning me into a baby, Harry. A little baby. A wastronaut. <laughs> Let's see. Fifty seconds left. Plus time out. Clock stoppages, commercials, commentary, and minus the 10 minutes it takes to get a message out here. And. <laughs> Did you hear that, Harry? The Texans. One. They finally.
persuasive speech. This is a presentation that seeks to identify and describe an ongoing problem. The speaker uses emotion, logic, and credibility in an attempt to urge the audience to act on a controversial issue. Tonight, Eve Dowdell will present a persuasive speech. Eve recently took first place with a speech at the NTFA Championship. Big round of applause for Eve! This involves confining an individual in a 
six to nine foot long stuff, 24 hours a day, for over two weeks. However, according to the journalist resource in 2023, many inmates spend years in isolated cells. I got rid of Fox, who spent nearly 44 years in solitary confinement, according to APR in 2023. Furthermore, this practice disproportionately targets racial minorities, youth, senior citizens, people with disabilities, and pregnant women, according to the 2023 Civil Rights California Report. This practice has extreme physical, emotional, and cognitive consequences. 2023 research from the National Lab of Medicine shows that even just a few days of isolation can lead physical and psychological symptoms such as psychosis, hypertension, suicidality, anxiety, and self-harm. Additionally, a 2019 report from the Peer Review Journal of the Medical American Association shows that solitary confinement is associated with significantly higher rates in post-release morbidity and mortality, including a 78% increase in suicide. U.S. Senate Majority Whip Dick Durbin said in a 2022 report, the goal of prisons should be to rehabilitate offenders and prepare them for successful re-entry into the society. If that's the goal, why are state and federal prisons relying on a practice that destroys this possibility? To answer this question, we will move on to examine two main causes. Legal obligation and lack of enforcement. First, Prisons have a legal responsibility to protect inmates. In an article last access in January 2024, Basin explains that prisons have a legal duty to protect inmates from assault from other prisoners. Because solitary confinement isolates an individual, prisons claim it prevents violence. However, in the previously cited Justice Hall's essential report, the solitary treatment one receives in protective custody is almost indistinguishable from disciplinary custody. Furthermore, this lack of evidence to support the claim that solitary reduces violence. According to a policy brief by the California Research Bureau in February 2023, prisons don't consistently track their use of solitary and whether it reduces violence at all. But as we've seen, there is proven evidence of the substantial negative ramifications including the thousands of inmates that have faced physical, verbal, and sexual abuse in solitary confinement. The next cause is lack of enforcement. Even when states like New York pass legislation to protect individuals, this is effectively rewrite the law. According to a 2022 article from the New York Focus, the state of New York passed legislation prohibiting solitary people with disabilities. However, the Department of Corrections and Community Supervision crafted its own definition of disability, prohibiting solitary for only select populations among the most severely disabled. The article explains that prisons in New York have sent hundreds of people to solitary legally. Take the example of Doreen, a woman diagnosed with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. The article explains that Doreen has been doing reasonably well, taking medications, managing diagnoses, and earning time off her symptoms through prison programs. But after fitting herself in a fight, Doreen was sent to solitary, where inmates are denied showers, phone calls, religious services, and educational programs. What's this supposed to do? Doreen to her ass the New York Focus. Someone who is bipolar, Schizophrenic, sitting in a cell all day alone. They get suicidal. Of course, this worsens conditions for people in solitary. How could it not? Now that we understand why this problem persists, let's look at solutions on the federal, state, and individual level. The National Advocacy Group, Oh Not the Box, keeps an updated tracker of legislation aimed to limit or ban the use of solitary. One well, last access on February 22nd. None of the thousand plus bills have been made it to vote. In my own state of California, one promising bill was introduced. AB 280 
or the California Mandela Act, would make three major changes in regards to solitary confinement. First, it would completely ban its use on vulnerable populations, including anyone under the age of 25 and over 59 years old, people with disabilities, and pregnant women. Second, it says limits to confinement to no more than 15 consecutive days and no longer than 17 hours a day. This strict definition protects individuals from prolonged isolation. Finally, it requires prisons to keep clear and current records of their use of solitary and inmates' well-being in order to provide transparency. The California Manila Act is an important start. It's imperative that we push California and other states to adopt similar legislation. Additionally, Congress and the President to adopt the same reforms in federal detention facilities. To that end, I created a website with steps you can take to keep the pressure on. This includes scripts to contact the federal and state representatives. Reach out to them. Let them know we must stop this inhumane practice. We can also take action with individuals. The Appalachian Advocacy Group, Unlock the Box, is committed to building on laws like the California Mandela Act to ban all solitary confinement. But they need help to do so. If you are as passionate about this topic as I am, consider donating time, resources, or even funds for efforts. We have the power to be the final generation that allows this type of state-sanctioned torture to persist. But only if we are willing to act. By examining the problems, causes, and solutions, we are saying that we must put an end to this inhumane use of solitary confinement. Since Robert King's release in 2001, he served as an activist, a speaker, an author, dedicating what remains of his life to ensure others will not suffer the way he did. It's time that we join him and send the message that even in solitary confinement, you were never truly alone. We have come to our final event, debate. In this style of debate, speakers are randomly assigned to argue opposing sides of a controversial issue. Debate is a true test of critical thinking and strategy because speakers must often side with the, with the side that they may not personally agree with. Despite this, speakers must identify and present a valid and compelling case in order to win. The team who prepares the best arguments for the side is declared the winner. In this debate, you will hear from an affirmative speaker and a negative speaker. Tonight, our debaters are Tristan Seha and Kayla Roslin. In the fall, Tristan took silver in this event, and Kayla took bronze this semester at our first spring tournament. Please stand by one moment as we prepare to start the debate. I call the house to order. As a reminder to the audience, debate is an interactive activity. Please knock, clap, stomp your feet, and say hear, hear, if you think a debater is making a good point. This will help keep things exciting while also letting the debaters know what arguments you all like. I now recognize the debater from the affirmative team to deliver a constructive speech not to exceed five minutes. All right. Our resolution today is social media has done more harm than good. I see affirmative. I also have to vouch for this. And the negation has to say that social media has ultimately done more good than harm. Now, as some top of case, I'm going to first do a bit of resolution analysis. Now, the University of Columbia, Columbia puts it best when they state that social media can provide platforms for bullying and exclusion, unrealistic expectations about body image and sources of popularity, normalization of risk-taking behaviors, and can be detrimental to mental health. I think they put it the best. Now, let's define social media real quick. 
a digital technology that allows people to share ideas, information, and content through virtual networks and communities. Now, this is a debate that there has to be a weighing mechanism set since it's a value debate. So we're going to be weighing this on the value of quality of life. In today's debate, we should be prioritizing the well-being, whether, whether of a population or in the, of the individual, emotionally and physically. Now, moving straight into my first contention is on mental health and psychological impacts. Now, social media has adverse effects on mental health and psychology of people it influences. According to the National Library of Medicine, several studies have indicated that the prolonged use of social networking sites may be related to signs and symptoms of depression. In addition, some have indicated that certain activities might be associated with low self-esteem, self especially in children and adolescents. Now, in a study done by Yale Medicine, there are those that experience cyberbullying related to depression, body image, and disordered eating behaviors, and poor sleep quality that have all been linked to social media use. Now, it's often that these negative effects aren't frequently talked about and are seen as just a simple roadblock. But the problem is that such examples as social comparison, envy, cyberbullying, harassment, fear of missing out, uh, addiction, and sleep disruption, they're, they're left out of the conversation, especially when it comes to social media. These are impacts that will have eventual bad <laughs> implications on our lives and our future generations, and we're not taking it seriously. Now, moving to some psychological impacts. According to Georgia State University, social media use, just as the use of alcohol or drugs, can hijack the dopaminergic pathways more quickly and reliably than naturally derived awards such as studying hard and getting a good grade, and the effort gained from actual diligent and time-consuming work is slower to access the reward system while checking Instagram causes a rush of dopamine. It's a very interesting problem to notice that the more we use it, the worse our symptoms actually get. Now, attention spans are another bad issue. Attention spans are getting very impacted by social media. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I gotta look up a Subway Surfers video or Minecraft parkour real quick. Uh, uh, all right, sorry, I'm, I'm back. I, I'm concentrating again. Now, as much as a joke this is, but actually according to standardasl.org, it's actually a very serious growing problem. Due to increased time spent on social media, teenagers' attention spans have decreased. TikTok's algorithm serves a, as, a, as a bit of a benchmark here, with a platform for de presenting its users with a cycle of engaging clickbait, bright colors, and catchy songs packed with short videos with the intention of acclimating viewers to process the content quicker and with less debt. Now, the more content is consumed, the bar continues to rise for the level of engagement that content must provide to keep the public's attention. All of this to show there's a bad issue. Attention spans are negatively affected by TikTok, all of these other social media platforms, the more that they become short-form content. Now, in another article from standardasl.org, short forms of media, which can be defined as content that is under 10 minutes or 1,200 words, play the most important role in high school students decreasing attention spans. I know it's definitely had an effect on me. Now, moving to my second attention, ultimately, is privacy concerns. Now, in an article by Forbes, a research team found that 26 billion rec or recorded databases that have been compiled by a malicious actor or data broker where they can leverage the aggregated data for a wide range of attacks, including identity theft, sophisticated phishing schemes, targeted cyber attacks, and unauthorized access to personal and sensitive, sensitive accounts. The leak has affected Twitter, LinkedIn, Dropbox, and many other social media platforms. Privacy is really bad especially when companies are collecting your data and using it for possibly malicious means. But not only that, but the more data they collect, the more likely it is that it'll be hacked and used against you. Now, for my third contention, it's going to be misinformation. According to peerresearch.org, more than 8 in 10 Americans get news from digital sources among 18 to 19, or 18 to 29 year olds. And they view it that it's one of their most sourced and areas of news. Now, the outrageous fact is that fact is ultimately less loud. The actual louder one is the not fact, the false information. It's, le it's more easy for people to believe information that is actually false and then forget that there was a correction and never see that correction. People are more likely to be believing that an actor suddenly died, that, oh my gosh, I can't believe Harrison Ford is gone, rather than actually going and looking up whether or not he's there. I hope he is. All of this to show, social media has caused some very, very impactful problems. Not only are we seeing now, that we're going to see for generations to come. And it will affect the quality of life of every single generation after. And these are impacts that we need to understand, and we need to try at least to get ahead of them. The problem is that without it, right now, social media has done more harm than good. Thank you.
the negative now has two minutes of cross-examination to ask questions of the affirmative team. Hi, Tristan. How's your night going? It's going pretty well so far, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> That's great to hear. Um, so my first question would be, how do you define prolonged use of social media? Uh, prolonged, well, I would say it's more of like, prolonged use is probably like upwards of three hours to somewhere in that range above that uh, at a time. Most people will binge for those three hours and above in a single setting or a single um, use case, so. Okay, and then in your first contention, you said certain activities might be associated with low self-esteem. What activities are you referring to? The activities specifically. Yeah, what activities are associated with low self-esteem? Uh, well, say if you were browsing on the internet, you were seeing someone that is having an amazing life, like they invested in Bitcoin early, suddenly you are very sad that you didn't. So just browsing? You could browse, you could find specific so, uh, forms that are being actually given to you by the algorithm that focuses you on more ideas that you might relate to or might be feeling at the moment. Okay, my next question is how many people are actively being cyberbullied? How many people are actively being cyber? Well, I certainly hope not a lot. But uh, in order to quantify that, it would be an unreasonable and an unrealistic survey. I don't think anyone really wants to admit that they've been cyberbullied. So, so you don't stage. have a, a number of how many people have been cyberbullied? I don't think there is a statistic for those that have been cyberbullied. Okay. How many users are actively on TikTok? How many users are actively on TikTok? I don't have a specific number for you. Okay. Um, and in your second contention regarding privacy, um, do users agree to share this data with terms and conditions? I, I mean, yes. I don't know when the last time any one of you read the terms and conditions. But um, yes, you are basically signing your information and your personal information away. And for your third contention regarding misinformation, what percentage of news found on social media actually contains misinformation? Uh, well, about, from especially TikTok, uh, users that had searched uh, top news stories, about 20% 20 of that news contained misinformation. Perfect. I have no further questions. I now recognize the debater from the negative team to deliver a constructive speech not to exceed six minutes. Thank you to everyone for coming. I'm um, very excited to do this debate, and it's amazing to have so many people here for this. Thank you for coming. Um, as a brief off-time roadmap, I'm going to read my own negative case, and then I'm going to argue against Tristan's case. Let's begin. Today's resolution states, social media has done more harm than good. Now, I would like to state that it is the burden of the affirmative to demonstrate that social media has done more harm than good. However, it is only the burden of the negation to show that social media is at least equally as good as it is harmful. Moving on to my first counter contention. Connections. According to Biomed Psychology 2023, social media enhances mental health by promoting social connections and peer support, enabling individuals to maintain relationships with friends and family members worldwide, thus fostering a sense of belonging and community. This connectivity is especially valuable for those who are isolated or living abroad. Social media also empowers users to support causes that affect change, as evidenced by movements like Me Too and Black Lives Matter. These movements have used social media effectively for advocacy, leading to significant societal impacts, including workplace protections, criminalization of non-disclosures for sexual harassment, and legal support for thousands of victims who experience harassment in the workplace. This is according to Carlson University 2023. Black Lives Matter resulted in policing reforms like bias training, body cameras, and no-knock no warrant bans, according to Brookings 2022. Social media has played a critical role in empowering individuals and communities, enabling them to mobilize for social cause, raise awareness for critical issues, and influence social change, thereby directly contributing to a safer and more equitable society. Counter contention two, education. 
Social media significantly enhances education by offering a vast array of content on virtually every subject imaginable, making knowledge more accessible than ever before. Educational institutions and teachers use social media to share educational materials, conduct webinars, engage with a broader audience, and contributing to global education and awareness. According to the National Library of Medicine, October 2021, social media has positively impacted medical students in China, boosting academic performance, collaboration, group discussion, and idea change. Similarly, a study of Northwest University confirms that social media use facilitates improved academic outcomes, communication, and self-directed learning among students. Social media breaks down barriers to learning, ensuring that individuals from all backgrounds can achieve personal growth and success, thereby elevating their quality of life. Pattern of attention three, economic opportunities. Forrest 2024 reports that over 4.9 billion social users are active with the net market of more than $49 billion in 2023. And this is expected to grow by 26.2% every single year. Influencers alone brought in $4.8 billion, a figure set to rise sharply. With 77% of small businesses leveraging social media for customer engagement, these platforms have become crucial for economic opportunities, allowing entrepreneurs and companies to keep and tap into the global market. The expansion into digital marketing, e-commerce, and the gig economy not only fosters economic growth, but significantly increases job opportunities. For example, according to CNN in 2015, Facebook alone is responsible for more than 4.5 million jobs. By empowering entrepreneurs and businesses to tap into the global market, social media platforms facilitate economic growth and opportunity, paving the way for a more equitable world with improved quality of life for many. Now moving on to my opponent's case, his first contention, he states that national health and prolonged use may be related to depression. However, he defined prolonged use as more than three hours. So the simple way to negate the negative effects of prolonged social media use is to simply regulate your own social media use so you use it less than three hours a day. Furthermore, he says certain activities might be associated with low self-esteem. Well, this is definitely proving correlation. It doesn't actually contribute to causation. Furthermore, his only list of activity was scrolling. Okay, well, if you're going to scroll for more than three hours, once again, the simple explanation is just limit your scrolling time. Furthermore, he goes on to talk about how cyberbullying can lead to depression in the body image. Well, he doesn't tell us how many people are being cyberbullied, so we don't even know if this is statistically significant. For all we know, 1% of social media users could be cyberbullied. That's not significant, and he can't tell us otherwise. Furthermore, moving on to the psychological psychological impacts, he's stating that the TikTok's algorithm can cause a decrease in um, in users' attention span. However, he doesn't tell us how many people are actively using TikTok, nor does he tell us by how much our attention span is decreasing. Is it decreasing by five minutes? Is it decreasing by five seconds? He simply doesn't tell us. And according to ABA Psychology 2023, the average 16-year-old has an attention span of 30 to 40 minutes. Furthermore, moving on to his second contention, he is stating that all of this data is collected and we're vulnerable to hacking. However, we all agree to share this data. There are terms and conditions that you agree to every single time you sign up for something. So if you don't want your data to be collected, you don't agree to the terms and conditions. Furthermore, he states that 26 billion records have been compiled and could be used for the attacks, but he doesn't provide us with any substantial evidence of these attacks occurring and what their impacts are. So this data is just sitting there and it might be used, it might not be. We simply don't know what the impacts are. And furthermore, in his third contention regarding misinformation, he stated that only 20% of TikTok's news is actually misinformation. That means more than 80% of the news that you see, at least on social, on TikTok, is correct information. So when we talk about the actual resolution of social media doing more harm than good, even with misinformation, 80% of the information you're receiving is accurate. That's still more than 20%. For this reason, I strongly urge a vote in negation. Thank you. The affirmative now has two minutes of cross-examination to ask questions of the negative team. Alrighty, 
I have two minutes, I'll start that right now. All right, so let's see. You are saying that social media has had a positive impact on education, correct? Yes. Gotcha. So you're saying that you would trust someone that was educated through TikTok? That is not, not what I said at all. Actually, I said according to two separate studies, social media has positively impacted students, boosting their academic performance, collaboration, group discussion, and idea exchange. Nowhere did I say anyone was being educated from TikTok. Gotcha. All right, and then so let's see. Your, your proposed solution is to simply stop scrolling, essentially, right? The idea is to limit and cut yourself off. Um, well, we both agreed that using social media for more than three hours a day is could potentially be detrimental. So if you don't want to have any of those negative side effects, then yes, you could limit yourself to less than three hours a day. Gotcha. But then are we talking about the current, what we are currently seeing, or are we talking about fixing an issue? Are we talking about fixing an issue, or are we talking about the current situation? Um... I'm just talking about how you can overall mitigate and minimize the potential negative harms of overuse of social media. Gotcha. All right, and then let's see. You talked about how we basically agreed to share this data, but if we are agreeing to something and then the company is then selling that data in a way that is going to put you at risk, would you not say that that is a deficit? Not if it's in the terms and conditions that you agree to. Gotcha. All right. Uh, I now recognize the debater of the affirmative team to deliver a rebuttal speech, not to exceed three minutes. All right, this is gonna be a little chaotic. <laughs> so let me give you a brief rough idea of what I'm gonna first do. So I'm going to first go over my opponent's counter contentions and their refutes to my case, and maybe if I have time, I'll try and see if I can touch up in my own contentions. But if not, I'll brush up on my last speech. All right, and with that, I will start my time now. All right, now going immediately into their first town convention and describing how it enhances mental health by maintaining connections. The problem is that maintaining connection and allowing this is not exactly a unique factor to social media. And now I'm not exactly pulling out my telegraph, but it's not exactly something that you can't communicate with someone unless you have social media. That, rely, that puts a reliance on social media that simply shouldn't be there. Social media is a good tool. But if you're trying to over-rely on it, and you're saying that it's going to connect you with every single person you meet, then there's a problem. If I met someone online, and they, well, say met, met them in person, uh, I could either be uh, stuffed in a duffel bag, or I could find someone that's very interesting. The problem is that it's always a risk when you go online. And if you're trying to say that forming connections inherently, completely, is a benefit, that's a fallacy. The idea is that there is benefits, but there's also deficits. Forming connections can be good, but it can also be bad when you form connections with malicious people or people that wish to do you harm, especially those who are, say, identity theft or others that simply don't have your best interest in mind. Now, moving into some of the, their second kind of connection, talking about education. Now, as great as social media really is, I don't think I really rely on it for an education. Now, we did, it, we did say that technically, no, they're not getting an education through TikTok, but I mean, most people that find news or interesting things on TikTok will take it as fact. That's the problem. If you're seeing things on social media and then taking it as fact, that means you are then not being educated properly and you're not getting a real good education. That isn't exclusive to TikTok. That is on Instagram or other Twitter ideas. People can share whatever they want, but it's up to the actual user to be able to understand what it is. But in most cases, they typically don't because they're not educated, which inherently is the problem. Now, counter contention three describing equal are the economic opportunities. As much as I love big companies that love to sell my data for a profit, I really don't think they have my best interest at heart. The problem lies with when they're taking all that data that they're collecting from you, and then they're selling it to other companies that also don't have your best interest at heart, and then eventually one of those companies gets hacked, and all of your information is laid bare to whoever was able to breach. We have seen countless breaches. I mentioned a 26 billion account breach. That is a humongous number of people that possibly now have to worry about identity theft. They have to worry about horrible, uh, horrible possible future issues. It's just a bad thing in general. Now, going on to the reputation, prolonged use, and that you can simply regulate it, 
We're not talking about that. We're talking about the harms that social media has already done. We're not talking about, well, in the future, we can simply have a set time that you can watch and like, view social media and then you're done. The problem is that in the status quo, I'm pretty sure a lot of people in here use TikTok and a lot of them do scroll. It happens, and you can't simply say, I'm gonna cut myself off. Especially in the status quo, most people are doom scrolling for hours on end. It happens, and simply saying that we can simply regulate it and simply regulate your own time doesn't really make sense in terms of allowing what's already happened. You can't fix what has already happened, which is what we're arguing here, the status quo. Now, many people, my opponent described that we don't know many people, or we don't know how many people are being cyberbullied. Contextually, a lot of, if you see a post on Instagram, you will see many comments Many, many comments talking about how horrible they look. It is absolutely horrendous. The 20% of news from TikTok is, yes, there's 80% that is normal, but the problem is that 20%, the people that see that are going to take that and run with it. That's the problem with false information. It's going to be there, and though it's a 20% figure, it's always going to be there, and people will take that face value. That's the problem. Inherently, social media has done more harm than good in the status quo. My opponent can try and say that, well, in the future, we can regulate it. We can regulate your time. The problem is that we're talking about right now. If we're talking about right now, people do scroll endlessly, and I'm sure many of you are guilty of doing so. I now recognize the debater from the negative team to deliver a rebuttal speech not to exceed five minutes. I think Tristan is underestimating the willpower that people have. First of all, you can set a timer if you want to limit your scrolling. Second of all, there's an app for that. There's multiple social media apps actually that will help you to set timers on how much you're scrolling. So simply saying that that's not possible or that's not feasible actually undermines our own personal abilities to have self-control. If you want to control how much social media you're using, there are ways that you can do it. Furthermore, moving on um, to him talking about social media and him saying that he's seen lots of comments about people being cyberbullied, that's great, but we can't measure how much it is. We don't know how many people are being cyberbullied, and we don't really have a statistical answer of whether or not it is significant. Yes, there could be, and there probably are people who are being cyberbullied, but does that mean that all of the other benefits that social media has provided to us are automatically outweighed? It does not. We're not saying as a negation that there are no negative effects of social media. We're simply saying social media is at least equally as good as it is harmful. Moving on to the second contention regarding privacy, you are agreeing to the terms and conditions that are set forth within these apps. You are consenting to your data being collected. He then tried to say that he had provided evidence about a hack actually happening. He did not. His evidence states that 26 billion people have had their data recorded. He has not provided any evidence of cybersecurity attacks. He has not provided any evidence of the impacts of this actually happening. All he's saying is the data that you are consenting to give has been collected. Great, we're all consenting to it. Furthermore, moving on to his third argument about misinformation, only 20% of TikTok information or TikTok news actually has misinformation. 80% of it is good to go. He also fails to um, state that when you're watching these videos, there is a little icon that comes up that says, hey, by the way, this is probably misinformation. He's also undermining our own ability and our own knowledge by stating that most people are uneducated and most people are just going to agree whatever with whatever it is they see on social media. I don't know about you, but I don't like being thrown in with the uneducated group of people who are just going to agree. I do my own research. I can clearly read when something says this is misinformation. And the fact is 80% of what you're seeing is not misinformation. So when we're talking about more harm or more good, 80% of what you're seeing is actual valid information. Moving on to my own case, and his own arguments about my own case, he's stating in my first contention that 
connections and maintaining connections is not reliant on social media. It may not be reliant on social media, but compared to the telegraph, which is what he recommended, I would rather have a FaceTime with my family members, seeing them in real person, having a conversation, than hearing a bunch of beep, 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 on a telegram, okay? It's not reliant on social media, but the fact is it has done so much good in making connections. He also stated, well, I could meet someone on the internet and they could put me in a body bag. I never said anything about meeting random people on the internet. I said you can maintain relationships with family and friends that have moved across the globe. Do not meet random strangers on the internet. That is a bad idea. Moving on to my second contention regarding education, he's saying that most people just take things on social media as fact and that people are getting their education from social media. That's not what the negation said. I said that people are using social media to enhance their learning. MJC's on social media, even our speech and debate team can be found on Instagram. Literally, all we're saying is social media has improved people's access to knowledge, has improved people's access to online classes, for example, Canvas, Blackboard. Those are all examples of social media that you are actively using as a student that is enhancing your ability to learn. Furthermore, his argument against my third contention, stating that I don't think big companies have our best interests at heart, I never mentioned big businesses. I actually stated that 77% of small businesses utilize social media to create a wider and more global audience. Furthermore, these businesses are actually providing jobs, providing economic growth. We've seen $49 billion of economic growth, and that's proceeded to um, increase by 26% every single year. And Facebook alone is responsible for 4.5 million jobs. So when we look at today's resolution, social media has done more harm than good. Are there some people that have been cyberbullied and have bad things happen to them? Yes, but that doesn't negate all of the positive things that we have seen with social media, with connections, education, and our economic opportunities. Thank you. And for this reason, I urge you to negation. I now recognize the debater from the affirmative team to deliver a rebuttal speech, not to exceed three minutes. Hey. Awesome. Considering this is my last speech, I want to thank you for being here. I know that you were possibly, uh, you were not forced, but you were told to be here. So I thank you guys for coming regardless. So it's been an awesome time to be up here. And, uh, it's a fun to you guys, and we really appreciate you guys today. So doing a brief off-time roadmap of what I'm going to do here, I'm first going to go over my opponent's uh, rebuttals to my contentions, and then go over their own counter contentions and finish up with some uh, closing understanding of this entire debate. And with that, I'll start my time right now. All right. My opponent is saying that you can set timers. Now, I don't know how many of you woke up to alarms today, and how many of you clicked that little snooze button, but it is mighty tempting. I will say, the snooze button, whenever I wake up, is very tempting to me. And if I have to click snooze to keep watching my little TikTok, I will do it. Now, I'm sure many of us can attest to why that little extra bit of time to social media, say if you're trying to look at a TikTok, you can definitely say that you want a little more time to watch it. So saying that we can simply have cutoffs and timers simply isn't a very good solution in terms of what are we already having negative effects of social media. Now, going to their second, or describing their second contention, describe that it's agreeing to some of the, the info, that we're agreeing for them to do this. The problem is that we're not allowing them to, say, take our data and then resell it to other companies who are then going to put you more at risk and then selling it to other companies who are going to put you more at risk. My opponent described that we never, or she never mentioned more, or big businesses. The problem is that in her first speech talking about how it's a big market cap and there's more money, the problem is that all that money is coming from big corporations that are selling your data. They're selling it for ads, personalized ads. I don't like to see the things that Amazon knows I want. It's not very great, but I mean, <laughs> all to it, they make money off of it and that's why they do it. That is big companies. You can say that the small businesses have had good and better areas of like advertisement. But again, that's not unique. Advertisement has always been around. Newspapers, they've been around. They're still around, believe it or not. Now, going to my first kind of contention describing that it is ultimately not reliant on the, uh, or that it's not going to be reliant, and that it's been a good area of avenue. So the problem is that all of this information and that all of these people that are being affected, it's not reliable, essentially, is what my opponent is stating. 
The problem is, contextually, I'm pretty sure many of us have gone on Instagram and gone on comment sections. Clearly, someone has some kind of issue with cell phones. <laughs> I don't know how many people really have beef, but it's quite clear sometimes who really hates who. Cyberbullying is something contextually we can all agree definitely exists, and it definitely exists on the widespread, especially on social media. Now, going to some of the other things, my opponent describes about the connections, but ultimately, you can't ignore what is inherently a part of social media, that connections. You can't ignore the fact that you can meet someone online that you don't know in person, and then go meet them in person, and uh, hopefully they're not a murderer. The problem is you can't ignore that. My opponent can't say that, well, we simply are talking about that. We are talking about that, because social media puts you in contact with people that you otherwise wouldn't be put in contact with, which is what my opponent's entire argument is about, connections. But there's a deficit to the connection that we can be in Ultimately, all of these things culminate together. Social media, in the status quo, has done more harm than good. We are seeing negative effects on our, uh, on our kids. We've seen it on our generations ourselves. We've seen it going to affect our continuous generation, seeing that we are ultimately affecting our attention span, we're seeing depression, we're seeing harassment, we're seeing cyberbullying, all of these things that simply can't be ignored. We can't ignore it any further, and it's not being addressed. Though my opponent can say that you can simply cut your time off, I'm gonna keep scrolling, and we shouldn't have to cut our time off in order to not be harassed or seen as